Jay Baba, everyone, welcome to the celebration once again for Margaret Krask, Baba's mm -hmm. beloved dancer. What we're going to do first is, I think, open with a video uh, of photographs of Margaret so we all kind of have a memory of right close to our hearts of Margaret's beautiful form. And um, then we'll have a bio from Karen Talbot. And then we'll open up for a potpourri, Jay Baba. Dancer dancing to his words, footsteps winging as a bird, abandoned flight. A blazing light whirling in divine romance. Dancer, dancer, dance is dance to the drum of God men. Heart in which all music has its start from creation's soundless singer to every gesture, every glance, dance, dancer, dance. Of his smile, you may want to rest a while, but keep on dancing, dancer. Please not to rock. Dance can never see. Dance can never 
To also thank Kathy Riley, those beautiful photographs that you sent me, Kathy, I uh, put into this video as well. So I would like to um, open up then. Did you have something, Kat? No. I would like to open it up then to Karen Talbot. If you'd like to go ahead and read for us, Karen, your bio, that would be fabulous. Hey, Baba. It was just lovely to see those photographs. Miss Margaret Krask was born on November 26, 1892 in Mudford, Suffolk, England. She passed on February 18, 1990 in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Her ashes are interred at Upper Maribod next to Elizabeth Patterson. She had two sisters, Dorothy and Olive, and the Persian name Baba gave her was Zulika. Margaret began dancing at age 14. She was very athletic. In 1918, she began lessons with Enrico Cicchetti. In 1920, Digolev hired Margaret. She was an immediate prodigy. Her career came to an end when she damaged her Achilles tendon, at which time she became Cicchetti's assistant and took over teaching at his studio. Between 1929 and 1931, Margaret endured many losses in her personal life. Her mother, her father, her fiance, Digolev, Anna Polova died. Margaret needed a place to recover and rest. On her way to South England, she began talking with a woman. The woman told her about Meredith Starr's retreat in Devonshire, and she suggested that Margaret visit. At the end of the conversation, the woman also mentioned that there were four hours of meditation daily. Margaret went to the retreat. When she arrived, she saw <clears throat> a photo of Meher Baba and asked who that was. Five months later, Meher Baba came to London with his entourage. It was Margaret who opened the door for Meher Baba when he first arrived at the London home of Herbert and Kitty Davies' parents to begin his mission in the West. She wrote, he was standing at the foot of the steps leading to the front door, dressed in a thin white gown, a short furry coat and a pink turban. And he was looking at the house very quietly. He passed in through the door and gave me a smile in passing. A little later, I went in to see him. I was very nervous and did not know how to address him. But as soon as I entered the room, I was completely won over by the love which seemed to permeate his whole personality. He spelled out on the alphabet board, it was your love that brought me to the West. 
She saw him at that moment as a vision of gentleness, grace, and love that touched the heart immeasurably. Baba asked her to come to East Chalicom, and she did on September 19, 1931, for four days. She wrote, of the four days which I spent in Devonshire with him and the group, it is difficult to write. The whole time was invested with a dreamlike quality of pure love, timelessness, and great beauty. Baba asked her to dance. She was wearing a tight skirt, country boots, and there was no flat surface. Kenneth Ross joined in with his bagpipes. She also traveled to Paris and was with Baba at the Eiffel Tower. Because she spoke French very well, Baba asked her to accompany him on the train to Marseille, where they would embark on a ship back to India. She had the compartment next to Baba's. Baba told her, if he knocked three times, that meant I love you. She was to knock back three times. This transpired throughout the night. On one occasion, Chanchi said of Margaret, she is a link type. Baba must have Margaret. In mid-April, 1932, Margaret went to East Chalicombe to be with Baba. And I have a photograph of um, when she was in Santa, Santa Margarita with him. Baba was in a playful mood. He made signs and Chanji translated that Baba should, that she should give Baba a dancing lesson. This was fun of the highest order, she wrote. Chanji took Baba's hand and brought him to class. Margaret then took his hand and showed him a simple one, two, three hop step, no obstacles. He took it at once and then hand in hand, we flew around the garden path. And I really mean flew. He could move as no one else has ever moved with joy, freedom, rhythm. And I knew without intellectualizing it that dance was, is and always will be a part of God. The next time she danced for Baba, she had no prep, heavy clothing, an old gramophone with broken records. She danced around the tables for one half hour. Baba returned to India in August of 1932. In February, 1933, Barbara was Margaret was one of the first Westerners to accept Baba's invitation to come to India for several years. They were sent back home after three weeks. Then Baba invited them to Nasik in December, 1936. This time they stayed until July, 1937. And Meher Baba returned to the West with them. Mayor Baba placed Margaret in charge of Rustam and Franey's son, Falu, when she returned to England. She was to see to his education and care. In 1939, Margaret received an order from Baba to come to India immediately and bring Falu. This was very difficult because of the war. She eventually left England, brought Falu, with only two 10 pound notes in her shoes. She was forced to leave the rest of her money in England. They arrived in Colombo, Sri Lanka. The money left in her shoe paid for their passage to Bangalore where they met Meher Baba in a penniless state. Margaret spent the next seven years in Meher Baba's ashram. She was given the job of reading the newspaper to him and then reading other books, including Agatha Christie, P.G. Wodehouse, Rex Stout, Tolkien, and others. She was also given the task to teach Mara and Mani to swim. She said Mara learned to swim due to her one-pointed devotion to whatever Meher Baba asked of her. She was also in charge of caring for many of the animals in the ashram. In 1946, Baba asked her to return to London and then go to the US. 
On May 1st, she traveled with Baba and Kakabaria to New Delhi. Then she took the train to Ahmednagar. She was Naraman and Arnavas's first guest at Ashiana. She stayed with them for 10 days while waiting for a birth to the UK. Baba told Marvin in India, prior to her traveling, she would lay cables for him. Laughing, Baba opened his hands and then spelled out on his alphabet board, you must go, I have made you my link in America. And I remember her telling how after being secluded with Baba and the women in India for all those years, she was on a ship populated by sailors. When she returned to um, London, she was invited by um, Anthony Tudor and Lucia Chase to give lessons to their dance company, American Ballet Theater. She arrived in New York by chartered airplane after briefly going to Canada to obtain the appropriate visa in 1946. At that time, she was 54 years old. By New Year's Day, 1947, she was actually teaching in San Francisco. In 1950, the American Ballet Theater and the Metropolitan Opera joined together to form the Metropolitan Opera Ballet School. She became the director and remained there until the school closed in 1968. She then joined the Manhattan Festival Ballet as ballet mistress until 1983. When it closed, she moved to Ballet School New York, where she taught for the next three years until her retirement in 1986 at age 94. During those years, she also taught at theater and school at Jacobs Pillow, Massachusetts and Juilliard School of Music and Dance. In 1952, Margaret Stancers, Tex Hightower and others came to the Mayer Center despite horrific weather conditions. Rudolf Bing came to know of Mayer Baba since they had to let him know they would return late. In 1952, during Meher Baba's first visit to the U.S., Delia phoned Margaret about the car crash. Baba wanted her to come to Prague. The next day she flew there. Baba asked her to exercise the muscles on the right side of his body without moving the bone structure. Three times a day, she worked on Baba's muscles on his right side and did what she could for Mara and Elizabeth. In 1956, she sat at the main table with Baba and others at Longchamp's restaurant. She was accompanied by Tex Hightower, Peter Saul, Bunty Kelly, and Maria Dare at the Holiday Inn in San Francisco prior to Mayor Baba's visit to Australia. In 1958, Margaret told Tex Hightower, Peter Stahl, and Don Mahler to carry Baba's chair at the center when he visited in 1958. Helen Bunty Kelly, who was Scottish, taught the dancers the Highland Fling to be performed in the barn for Baba. Um, Margaret wrote four books, two of which were books on dance that were highly acclaimed. She wrote The Dance of Love in 1980 and Still Dancing with Love in 1990. She shared stories of her life with Meher Baba in both of those books. She was a member of the board of directors of the Meher Spiritual Center for many years. When they first met, Meher Baba said to Margaret, I had not expected to find you so fast. Of her, Meher Baba said, you're a jewel of a disciple, J. Meher Baba. So beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity, J. Baba. J. Baba, a jewel of a disciple. So beautiful. All right, well, we're open for anyone who'd like to share something about Margaret, 
um, we all have kind of memories and stories. So it's kind of open um, to everyone now. As I said, it's probably going to be a little bit of a low key today because it, people are doing other things this Friday or Saturday rather after Thanksgiving. Um, gosh, what to say, <laughs> Margaret. I took a friend to the center uh, who was Oh, somebody who kind of walked the razor's edge. She was a very edgy person. I loved her. She was different and um, straightforward and sometimes a little too blunt. I loved her and gratefully she got her chance to come to Baba's Center. So we went to visit Margaret. I don't know, we just got lucky and, and she was staying at Kitty's. And so we met her outside on the porch um, on the screen porch. And I asked Margaret about the ring that she was wearing. It was just like a scarab, beautiful scarab uh, coral color, I believe it was ring. And so she told my friend Lynn Stevens and I about her ring. Um, so anyway, years go by. And I come back with a fiance fellow that I married. And um, so I said, well, Margaret, this is my fiance, Stephen Whitlock, and la la la. And I told him about the ring. And she said, Oh, no, no, you weren't supposed to tell anyone that. So of course, I felt bad. But then it turned up in the the, the next book that she wrote about this scarab ring and, and Baba giving it to her. So anyway, I'm going to stop there because I see our mischievous chicken has something. Che Baba. Well, um, I didn't have that much contact with um, Margaret. Is Susan Paul here today? Because um, I wanted to tell her story. I don't see Susan's name, so... Um, okay, well, I'll tell my, uh, Susan Paul's story. And Susan Paul's story is that, and I think I'm going to get it right. Uh, all her life, she was just uh, really wanting to dance from the time she was a little girl, but her mother didn't think it was a good thing to pursue. And Susan was begging and begging. So finally, um, her mother gave her said, well, you can't be a dancer, you can't study dance, but you can have a, a subscription to dance magazine. So that would come every month or whenever. And um, she was very drawn to this ad for Margaret Krask's uh, ballet school. And she just really wanted to go there. But again, the mother said no. It's not something you should be pursuing. So um, she felt very frustrated by this because she was very drawn to Miss Krask. So um, as the years went on, Susan uh, got married and had a daughter and she allowed her daughter to study with Miss Krask, but she was very intimidated by Miss Krask and she I mean, Susan was, and she never spoke to her. She used, just used to stand in the back of the room when her daughter was taking lessons and just gaze on Miss Krask. And so um, the years passed and um, Susan had never spoken to Miss Krask, but uh, so she became a nurse and then she got into acupuncture. She became an acupuncturist. And one day, uh, a friend of hers called her up and he said, um, you know, there's this family in Pune, India, and their uncle has had a stroke and they want a, an acupuncturist to come and treat him. And Susan said, well, you know, that's not going to be me. I have patience and I'm busy. And besides, you know, I... I, I don't like this whole dirty country of India <laughs> and I'm an atheist and whatever. 
So he said, well, they said, name your own price. So she said, name your own price. Well, so she, she quote, she just on a whim decided to give them some exorbitant price. And lo and behold, they agreed to it. So soon enough, Susan found herself on the way to Pune and she treated this uh, uncle every day with acupuncture. And uh, so there was a relative of his, I don't know if it was a nephew or a cousin, and they, they kept coming in and said, Susan, uh, have you ever been to uh, Maribad, to the ashram of Meher Baba? And she's like, no, I'm not interested. I'm just here for medical purposes. And he kept it up and kept it up. He's like, don't miss this opportunity to see God. She was like, oh, please. And um, so finally, just to get rid of him, she agreed to go. And um, so she uh, went up the hill and to the Samadhi and she met Nanaker and he gave her one of those hugs and she got like a charge and she started stumbling. She kind of became dazed. She started stumbling around um, uh, the hill up there outside the Samadhi. And at one point she tripped and she landed right on the grave of Margaret Krask. And then she knew it was all preordained and she became a Baba lover. Quite a story. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a story. Thank you for taking the time, Tina, to bring that to us today. Uh, yeah, I just think it's an amazing story. I love that yeah. story. Yeah. It, it's, he had her in his hand all along, and she had no interest until that moment. Hmm. Jay Baba. Tumbling right on to Margaret. She didn't even know Margaret had anything to do with Mayher Baba. She didn't. She didn't make the connection at all. Right. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Pretty cool. Viola. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Oh. Viola, I'm sorry, honey. For some reason, I don't know if I muted you. I didn't mean to. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Yay. Well, it's so funny. We're having this remembrance of Miss Krask and who should phone um, during Kat, Karen, your beautiful presentation, but Donald Mahler. And um, when there was that picture of Margaret Miss Crest on the motorcycle, that was Donald's motorcycle. And um, I'm not sure how to share about Miss Crest. The first time I met her besides as a little girl looking for candy um, from her, cause she would bring, she brought um, health food candies when she visited my parents in um, upstate New York, they'd moved out of the city and was when I was 14. And what I remember of Miss Krask, besides this amazing presence and really she had gravitas along with this wicked sense of humor. It was the most wonderful mix in my experience. Um, though I was too young to appreciate and really get her sense of humor at all. It's something I've later come to be aware of. And she was so knowledgeable about literature and, of course, dance and music and poetry. I remember she and my mother I thought I was going to hear about Baba, but we went there and then she and my mother started talking. Oh, literature, poetry, this and that. I, I mean, I knew I was in the presence of something um, far bigger 
than I usually am. And then on the those who were visited her in that Wellington hotel, she had pictures of Bob all along the top of the room. And I remember just looking and looking while they spoke and something was occurring, happening to me. Eventually, Miss Kresk turned to me and she shared the story of the evolution of consciousness, which again, kind of out of this world, nothing I'd heard in science class. And um, that uh, statement of her being a link through her truly without words or direct um, anything came that love of Baba's. And as a girl, just like tears were just coming down my face from that first meeting. And subsequently, I would visit her um, when going down to the center or passing through New York, the family had moved to the Boston area. And um, always I was more like um, my mother's kid. And Miss Crass would, you know, in her graciousness, see me and share with me and, and then off I'd go and she would give me different things of advice. Now the dancer said she never gave advice to them, but apparently being rather backwards, I needed some direct um, advice. And um, one day she said of Baba that um, because I was feeling very far from him, that Baba pulls you close and pushes you away and pulls you close. Of course, that I hear narrated in different people's experiences of being with Baba. And, and then we see it literally with Baba and Miss Kresk on film. And um, I just wanted, because I so delight in her a sense of humor and her humanness and her seeing the world, um, So, okay, the story of Miss Crask and Norina and um, Nadine. Miss Crask would joke about Norina wanting to be, you know, a prioress. And so Baba let her be the housekeeper. And um, I do remember Miss Crask sharing about these things. And um, one day, it's in the book too, um, Nadine was saying, Why don't you um, follow? Um, Narina, she's so much more spiritual than you. Um, and uh, Miss Kraft said, I don't know why I should follow Narina. I am one of Baba's circle and I'm following Baba. And I just love that she gave me the same sort of direction when I went to India the first time I was, I saw her when I was 19 and, and then it was, I just turned 20 when I flew over. And she said to me, now when you go there, everyone will be telling you what to do. You don't listen to anybody. Just it's your relationship with Baba, um, unless it's Mara. And then whatever Mara says, that's from, you, you know, she didn't say that's from Baba, but that's how I took it. And, um, and she, she, <laughs> she, she communicated different things um, about little um, changes in the in in the experience of being with Baba lovers and having been close with Baba. Um, so she told me, Prasad comes only from Baba's hand. Because you know, we would come back and I mean, I hadn't done it yet, but he would bring Prasad. Oh, this is you know, Baba's Prasad. Oh, she said, that's not Baba. It comes from Baba's hand. Don't get confused. And um, and then I can't remember the other thing she said altogether. She um, even though I knew her more as a child, even in the later years. Um, 
And though I saw her less frequently than I would have wanted and wasn't as close as many, 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 um, she was for me a um, link to Baba, truly. And it was the sense of Baba's presence that so overwhelmed me that first meeting when I was 14 as somebody who wasn't just running around looking for candy. Um, and then things I loved about her, the, the story of the patch on the pants. So Baba kept them in such poverty and raggediness and such um, almost want, you know, they were sewing clothes inside of clothes. So Miss Crask, it's in the book too. This, I mean, it's in the book. Miss Crask had um, <laughs> stitched on the back of their, and they didn't even get to see Baba. There they all were locked up with each other and, and Baba's out touring. And um, so she stitched on the back of her pants, the seat. God is love and prayed it around in her pants and everyone got a good laugh and Baba had a good laugh and what would we do if Baba didn't have a sense of humor and um so I just love that story about her and then I'd like to share because she's mischievous too you know that story about her coming to see the ladies for the first few times and they weren't supposed to mention a man's name. And so she'd be tongue-tied. She wouldn't know what to say. She wouldn't know how to have natural conversation. Baba pulled her aside and said, I told them you're so funny. What, you know, what happened, you know? <laughs> so, uh, her sense of humor, how Baba must have loved it. And, um, okay, Baba. Yes, that's a lot of sharing about Miss Crest. And I know there was one more thing I wanted to share about her. And um, she certainly was my mother's mentor. And um, from the time my mother met her till the time probably my mother passed last year. And she certainly was to me an amazing um, uh, grounding post. And then I'm just going to share one of Donald's quick stories about Miss Cress. Nobody minds and I then I'll stop sharing. And um, so that was just Donald on the phone and he had just shared with Matt and I on Thanksgiving this story that uh, he had learned how to make proper tea. And he was so happy. And so he went down to the center and there was Miss Cress and she met him in the, what was the original pitch in that little thing, I think. In those days, I didn't really know now. But anyway, so he heated the pot and dried the pot and put the leaves in and poured in the boiling water. And he took such care. And just as he's about to serve, he turns and looks at Miss Crass, very proud of himself. He said, you know, I'm not very fond of tea. <laughs> She's so mysterious. And um, didn't mind having a laugh with a story about her and Tex. So Tex, um, when he went to learn to dance at Jacob's Pillow, the first time he'd left the farm in Texas, and he was the only one who knew how to work. He was scholarship. No, none of the other scholarship boys could lift a finger, but he knew how to work. So he's doing the lawn with one of those lawn mowers, and he hears this coo, coo, something like that from the bushes. And as he keeps going and coo, coo. Finally, he turns his head and Miss Crest climbs out of the bushes as he described it with little twigs in her hair. And she said, Tex darling, have you no sense of fun or adventure? Something along those lines anyway. I just, she was game. And that's what Mara said of Baba. He was game and she was of his intimate circle and also got treated sort of a little bit like dirt sometimes by, you know, different ones who came to be, you know, I, but that's what we all experience. And that's okay, because that's just Baba trying to get our, our attention onto him, I think. And um, I won't share that stuff, but certainly I heard it. And um, so sending love in Baba's remembrance, um, 
and remembering this quest as his. <laughs> Jay Baba. Beautiful, Viola. Always. Thank you so much. You bring Margaret right to us. And it's funny that you bring, you know, that, that we're mentioning how Baba said she was such a, she was a link, a cable, a connection. I remember coming out of Kitty's one time, uh, the front door, and she was sitting right there to my right, writing. And I sat down next to her. I mean, I was tongue tied. I had nothing. I might have said, hello, Margaret. And um, she spoke and then she said to me something like, all you have to do is tell someone Baba's name or they see his picture. That's all you have to do with it. The rest is all for Baba. The connection, if it's there, will occur. You have nothing else to do with it, but just his name or his photo that you can, you can bring to someone else. So that, of course, you know, <laughs> that, of course, put me right in the right direction at that point in my life. I was young and, you know, I was ready to stop the traffic and tell them all about <laughs> the avatar has arrived. Yes, his name is Mayor Baba. So she kind of, you know, helped me get a direction. <laughs> Such a wonderful woman. Ah, Rosalie, Jay Baba, good morning. Jay Baba, I would say it's very interesting uh, being here today because, uh, you know, Margaret was such a great soul in the circle. And uh, I had very little personal contact. In fact, I, I found her intimidating. Um, her manner, um, I found it very put off. And, but I didn't have that much contact. It, it would have been different if I knew her, you know, or, you know, but Baba didn't allow that, you know. However, um, through her books, her books are, I just, I see them like, a certain incredible purity of words in them. Um, I love children's books because they don't banty about big words because they know big words. And Margaret didn't banty about, she like spoke her truth. She spoke her humor. And uh, I did want to share, I love her books. I absolutely love the books. Um, and one thing I wanted to share, I love the, the, the visual presentation. It's just so awesome to see the beauty of her, you know, and, and everyone that you do. They're beautiful souls. But, uh, you know, um, uh, and I love Karen telling the bio. Now, the bio... What I did want to include, it's true. Um, actually, it was Margaret's first order, is how she tells it in her book, that uh, Kitty Davies, when Baba first came to England, Kitty Davies' brother, I guess he picked Baba up, and he called uh, the Davies' house, and Margaret was there, staying there. And Margaret, I guess she answered the phone and, and Herbert says, I want you, Baba wants you to close every door in the house. That was not her house. That was, you know, and, it, and you know, she's very British. She did this like proper, close every door and you are to open the door to Baba. And I just see that, that to me was, like her life, like your personal feeling and devotion and, and your relationship with Baba is what is most important. Close every other door, you know. And uh, she was a real uh, symbol of that. I always felt that from the dancers, you know. Um, so I love that and actually, 
I'll, I'll just read the words because they're so beautiful. The first order. It was arranged that Baba should spend the first night in the one-time nurseries at the top of the Daisy's house, Davy's house in Earl's Court, and go to Meredith Starr's place in Devonshire the next day. A group of people, including, including Kitty Davy, went to the station to meet Baba, and I was asked to stay and greet him at the house. Just before the time for his expected arrival, the telephone rang. I answered it, and there on the other end of the line was Herbert Davy. His voice was excited and had a touch of uplift in it. He said, you don't know what has arrived. The most wonderful person you can imagine. And he sends you a message. You are to go round the house and close every door you find open. And then you must answer the front door yourself. I did, of course. I did not, of course, realize that this was my master's first order to me. In fact, I did not know that he was my master. But fortunately, I told Herbert that I would do as Baba wished. I nervously descended to the basement and shut the door, closed doors to rooms in which I heard voices. <laughs> she didn't even ask permission. Uh, and in fact, behaved in a strange house in an unforgivable manner. As soon as I had finished this odd performance, the bell rang and I opened the front door and there at the bottom of the steps stood the most appealing figure that one could ever hope to see. No sign of power, just a vision of gentleness, grace and love that touched the heart immeasurably. He came up the steps, gave me a passing glance and accompanied by Meredith, Chanji, and others, went up the stairs to his room. I remained in the hall. A few minutes later, Meredith came down the stairs and said very grandly, Mehababa wishes to see you. Overcome by nervousness, I said, oh, wouldn't he like to see somebody else first? Meredith looked at me sternly and said, may her Baba wishes to see you. I accordingly turned and climbed three flights of stairs to the most important moment of my life, the meeting with my master. He was seated quietly in a chair and he signed to Chanji to bring another chair and place it facing and close to his. He then beckoned me to sit there. For a moment or so, there was intense quiet. And then I had a strong feeling that it was important to look into his eyes. Courage came, and I did so. Looking in deeply, deeply, as far as I could. I have nothing to say about what I saw. In fact, I don't know. I only know that from that moment, whatever rough treatment he may have afterwards handed out, there has never been a moment's doubt as to his being the embodiment of love and life. Her books are precious, just precious. And it's, it's so funny because, you know, we have these celebrations, like we just had one for Marijuan Jessawala. And, you know, people get a little nervous. Well, not enough people come and it's just like, 
it's just like Baba's work, you know, like that was most joyous, just Marwan Jesawala. He was kind of almost a nobody of the Mandali. He was almost a nobody, you know, and uh, he was Erich's brother. But it was so profound and deep. Each one of these is it's sort of grace for us. And not to worry, that's the last thing we should worry about. Like Margaret says, just his name, to hear it, and a picture. We worry too much. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Thank you so much for reading, Rosalie. That was just sublime. It makes me want to go back to the books now. Thank you for doing that for me. They're both precious and that one other one where they were in very hot territory traveling around and they were sleeping on the roof of some building and uh, one of the farmers had brought his dying cow and he did it he should have probably done it earlier but he did it late and they were wanting to bed down you know they wanted to go to sleep they were tired and Margaret was sleeping on the roof of this building and all the vultures were all, all landed, all lined up waiting for that calf to die. And she made her nervous. So she had an umbrella and she opened the umbrella to, you know, buy her because she really needed to go to sleep. And she said, had I two umbrellas, I would have opened them both because uh, vultures don't get you until you take your last breath. And it, it, she said it so perfectly. <laughs> anyway, that was a little humor from the book. I recommend the book, Jay Baba. Jay Baba Rosalie, you always bring joy and humor with your shares. And I'm grateful. Thank you. Judy. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Oh, dear Miss Krask. <laughs> um, what a joy. I, I <clears throat> delighted. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a something in my throat. Um, I delighted in her humor as um, Viola so lovingly shared with us as well. Um, and actually your words, Viola, I think hit the mark perfectly that she had gravitas simultaneously with great humor. And that combination was um, utterly delightful <clears throat> to behold. And it, Baba, was so gracious to me in relationship to Miss Krask. And I call her Miss Krask as every one of her dancers always would do. It was never Margaret, ever. Um, and, um, and it was just my good fortune that I became good friends with um, Tex Hightower. <clears throat> But that's in the future. I'm going back to um, 1988. Um, in May of 88, the center was um, was planning, and none of this did I know, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Baba's last visit there in 58. And somehow, unbeknownst to me, Baba invited me and found me a place on the center for what turned out to be a three week stay. Um, they extended my time there beyond the normal two weeks that, that was allowed. Um, when other people were having to stay in motels and hotels around or, or you know, with other Baba um, lovers in Myrtle Beach and so forth, because so many people were there. And the center had invited every person that met Baba in 58 to come back as a guest speaker simultaneously. 
it was like the richest um, sharing of Baba's love every day, multiple talks, et cetera, um, for that three week period that was right on top of the timing, the exact time that Baba had been there in 58, of, in May of 58. And it fell to my lot, as Erich would say, that um, the person who was primarily, so this is about a year and a half before Miss Crass passed away. And, um, and so someone was with her kind of as a care, caregiver around the clock. And that person um, desperately needed a break. And she knew me from, from India. Um, so she asked me if I would be willing to take care of Miss Krask um, for several days so she could have a break. <laughs> and I, of course, jumped at the opportunity. Um, and Miss Krask, of course, most of those of you that were local, you know, had access uh, to her during those final years when she was living at Happy House. Um, but that particular period, every one of the living dancers came to Myrtle Beach for that occasion and basically spent all the time when they weren't on stage uh, giving a talk themselves there on the porch with Miss Crass and Happy House. And I'm running in and out with tea. And, you know, I, Baba gave me an excuse to be a fly on the wall. And it was the most delightful, so much laughter happened, absolute joy. And, and, and they were joking, they were laughing constantly and telling stories and remembrances um, of their, their times together. And, you know, generally for most of them, all three of Baba's trips to, the, um, to, to Myrtle Beach and, and so forth. And Miss Crass was telling stories and it, it was um, just one of the most delightful occasions in my Baba life. Um, and it was a way that I ended up getting to know and form connections with, with the, you know, various of the dancers, but most of all with Miss Krask and with the, the incredible kind of wry, impish sense of humor that she had so uniquely to her, um, and joking, tweaking every, Every comment, hardly a comment was straightforward. It was, there was always some little cutism in it. it, it I, it's hard, I, I can't begin to give justice to describe her sense of humor. Um, but she had it and she, and what was she in her just about 90, right? Um, anyway, she was, she was mature, she had many years, um, but she was so lively and so delightful. Um, and yes, anyway, so that was, um, that was a very delightful period with me, uh, for me. Um, and then um, I invited Tex, to come to Seattle, um, I remember I uh, it it was it was in the early '90s. I was already a resident over at Maribod, um, but in the summer I had met with Graham Stonebridge up in Victoria, and we decided to create a a Sahavas together. Um, I, he was gonna he was in Kelowna at the time, which is an eight hour drive from Seattle, north up into Canada. And um, I said, well, I'll, I'll get the, the guests. Uh, and I knew exactly who I wanted to, to ask as the guest, who was Tex Hightower. And, um, and he and his wife were gonna take care of um, housing everybody and at feeding and so forth. 
And so I invited Tex to come to Seattle and he stayed here in this little house of, um, um, actually in the room I'm sitting in um, for almost a week. Uh, we were here together and Tex is such a night owl that we stayed up almost every night till three in the morning and laughing. I, I think I've seldom laughed as hard in my life as, as that week with him telling and retelling, you know, all of these stories with Miss Crass and so forth. And, and that, that cemented our bond to get, then I drove the two of us eight hours north, uh, you know, up into Canada for, for a lovely Sahavas. And so anyway, uh, that created a deep connection between both me and Tex, but also me and Miss Crass, because second only to Mayor Baba, Miss Crass was central to Tex's life. Um, and, and then during my um, years staying at Maribod, Tex would come uh, usually around the 1st of November and stay for two or possibly three weeks, um, but usually about two weeks. And, and Baba had told him um, to come whenever he called him. And Tex said he would, and he consistently got an inner call to, <clears throat> to go to Maribod each, um, each year during, during the 90s. Um, and and but he would leave, um, you know, around the twenty first or so of of November. And Miss Kraft's birthday was the twenty sixth, so he would give me rupees every year um, to buy a really large, beautiful garland for Miss Kraft and offer it on her <clears throat> on her little tomb shrine um, there uh, next to Mayor Baba Samadhi on her birthday each year. And so again, for me that connected, um, it, it was another way of cementing um, her love for Mayor Baba. And as has been pointed out in today's um, session, the links that she had to so many different all, all of the dancers and, and then those of us that were outside those circles. <clears throat> and it just, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful dance. And, and speaking of that, one, one last little vignette for, of my life with Miss Crass was, um, in 2001, I um, did a two month trek following Baba's footsteps through Europe. And as part of that, I went, um, of course, to Portofino and to Santa Margarita. And the story that um, Karen read of, um, of Miss Crass accepting her student Thomas, I believe uh, was his name as a student, as <clears throat> to teach him dance in the backyard of, um, of uh, was it the Villa Fiorina, I think. Um, and I climbed up, I wanted to see where they danced together. So I quite precariously clomped through it because it was on a hill and got <clears throat> up around, I think I trespassed on various people's property and so forth to get there. But I got there and looked down, you know, on the, um, the yard where, where Miss Crass had taught Thomas to dance and found that dance was, is, and always will be part of God. Um, so I've 
I thank Baba for the joyous heart remembrances that even thinking of Miss Crass leaves in my heart. Jay Baba. Jay Baba Judy, thank you so much. Beautiful. Such beautiful remembrances. Kathy, did you want to read some from your book for us? That would be so cool. Oh, this is one of my favorite passages about uh, Margaret. And it just reading it again brings back so many wonderful memories. So there was a uh, talk at the meeting place by Rick Chapman and I was asked to drive Margaret to the program. In the evening, I drove Margaret to Rick Chapman's talk. As we went down the center road, there was a marvelous silver crescent moon above Baba's house. And Margaret asked if I could slow down so we could gaze at its beauty. Margaret began to sing an old song about the moon looking down on some lovers and their romantic tete-a-tete -tete below. She was so childlike and whimsical, gesturing and tapping my shoulder to the beat as she sang. By the way, she had a very nice voice. <laughs> then she remarked how curious it was that the wonderful old songs she knew when she was young have come back to her as she's gotten older. You'll see it's true when you get older, she said. We agreed that the old songs were classier than some of our present pop songs. I mentioned Mad Dogs and Englishmen. What was that other one that we all had to learn? She asked. I offered Begin the Begin. Oh, yes, Baba made us learn it and he wanted us to know it by the time he returned from a journey. We learned it, but what a row we made. It's very hard to sing, you know. When we got to the twin cabins, she remarked at the loveliness of the center. We agreed that Elizabeth's practical love for the center was extraordinary. She had done such an amazing job with the center's creation and maintenance. As we passed the original kitchen, Margaret fondly remembered Baba going in there in the 1950s. The program was wonderful. As we drove back to Dilruba, Margaret commented thoroughly about Rick's contention that there were no special observations with Baba. Love was the most important thing. Just loving him and others and longing for him more and more. That was the key. Margaret remarked that all the intellectual Baba talk drove her mad. I said that I supposed loving was really much harder to do than dry intellectualizing, which comes so much more easily. Margaret agreed and continued, we love him more and more because of Baba's incredible lovingness. That sweetness of his being continually overwhelms us and we learn and unlearn through his active giving and constant compassion. Because Baba is love, we finally learn to love. Then she added, with Baba, he helps you love more and more. He gives you more and more so that you may love more and more as the years go by. That's what she had found. It became easier. This was so very comforting to me. Boy, are we ever grateful that you wrote so much down, Kathy, that you kept such great records that you can share with us now about these amazing women. Mm. Mm. What an incredible story. Mm. Took us right there to the moon <laughs> and the tapping on the shoulder. I can almost feel it. Yeah, she was, oh my God. No one like Margaret Crass. Thank you for 
the opportunity to share. <laughs> if you have more, please feel free. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, when I went to uh, introduce this fellow that I was going to marry in New Orleans, um, we were on Kitty's porch and Margaret came out and spoke. And I don't know how it came about, but I think it was something like, uh, well, we'll be living in New Orleans. And Margaret said, oh, Kitty, that's like Marseille. That's like the ports in Marseille. <laughs> you know, yeah. she was so right. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't stay long. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Betty? Good morning, Jay Baba. Uh, um, I didn't meet Margaret, but I, I felt I got to know her through uh, these, the, her books and these wonderful videos, uh, The Frivolous Three, Kitty, Margaret, and Delia, and then uh, Hello Ducks, mostly about Margaret. Wonderful. I hope they're, I hope they're in existence still. And I just remember this little, little tidbit from the other one about Margaret. Uh, she had returned uh, from India, um, and I, I think she. Uh, it was it was quite an adjustment uh, coming back into, uh, I guess, civilization. But uh, um, I, re I remember I think that, that she felt a little, oh, kind of like her clothes were a little wrinkled, and she. It was she hadn't quite adjusted anyway to, to being back in it. And I think it, it, I think it was Anthony Tudor who said to her, he said, hello, ducks, seen the light? <laughs> oh, that's all. I just remember that wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's great, Betty. <laughs> that's great. But, uh, along with that, uh, she, I think she was walking along with, or it was, uh, uh, Yule Brenner was walking along with Tudor oh. and uh, uh, she, I think he introduced her to Margaret and, and, um, and Yule Brenner, I guess he didn't get enough attention or something because he says, I, I was in India when I was three years old and he made some weird remark and then he stalked off. And, you know, but I mean, she had the, she had that, uh, she was not a cow tower, you know, she wouldn't cow tower to people, you know, she didn't, you know, and he just, she pressed his button, his, his celebrity button, and that's in one of the books too, yeah, yeah. And they also thought she was a yogi and that, because a tutu disappeared. And she thought, they heard this thing that yogis, they swallow the, the gauze on the tutu to clear their system, whatever. <laughs> they found the tutu. <laughs> she had also, you know, I mean, that must have been challenging, just that about her, you know, the, her mystique, you know. Yes. Anyway, the, the books are amazing, you know, it, it and, um, uh, and, and also, so to see those pictures is so precious, you know, I, uh, the, the intimacy she had with Baba, and she really respected Mara. Margaret really respected Mara, and actually, Mara loved her company, and there was a time when um, it, Margaret would have, uh, uh, Mara would have preferred Margaret's company, but Baba put uh, um, uh, what's her kid, her, her and her mother uh, with her because she could deal. She had the force to deal with on trains, and she she had that gusto or whatever. But anyway, Margaret favored her. It was enjoyed her company. Yeah, yeah, and she really. She was all, she was very careful because when she was given that ring, because 
one day Baba says, I'll give you anything. What he was asking people, I'm giving anything. And she says, I, I want to be engaged to you forever, Baba. And then he gave her that ring the next day. And she never brought it up to Mira. You know, she was, you know, it was just not the thing to bring up, you know. And she was very respectful of Mira. Yeah. I thought that was incredibly beautiful about her. You know, she's she's a pearl. That that name means pearl. She was a pearl. Thanks, Rosalie. Viola. Jay Baba, and just on the tale of love being first um, that was so beautifully shared. My mother was uh, had a tape that had been made of Miss Kresk's last conversation with Mara, and I believe Monty got on. And um, I love you. I love you. They could say to each other. And when I I remember one visit to her, she shared about a young boy, young dancer, who came from a wealthy family, but the parents were very busy with things. He was very neglected, and he had become addicted to drugs. This was, you know, in the 50s or 40s, not the later, um, and that her um, concern and love for him, not, not judgment or harshness, but concern for him. And um, I just remember the lovingness of that kind of thing. And when Adi had come, she was very concerned that Adi's approach for the Western children might um, not let the youngsters hear or experience that the only thing Baba wanted was love. And um, yes, and compared to that, of course, what is there? And one thing I liked about her so much as I grew older was she's sort of iconoclastic. What mattered was Baba and love, period. <laughs> And everything else, all of our struttings and comings and going, that might be from Francis. I'm not sure where that's from. A little bit from Shakespeare, but anyway, what is it? Ah, nothing. And she was an artist. She was in the theater. She was with, you know what I'm saying. She was um, bound completely to Baba and in that free, seemed to me. So I just thank you everyone for sharing and Kathy, I just wanted to make a special thanks for reading your time with her because it was so immediate and so personal and so beautiful. And uh, to everyone who shared, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone and Ruthie and Karen and Rosalie and Judy and Betty and everyone I'm sure I miss, don't mean to, thank you. Jay Baba, Viola, that might be the place where we end. I don't see any other hands up. I, I wanted to ask, ask actually Viola something that has to do with Margaret and dance. Viola did, did uh, cause you went your own way with dance to the flamenco. What, did you ever have a sharing with Margaret about it or, or cause you know, your mom was a ballerina, she's, you know, Anything to say there, anything. Yes, um, <laughs> so it's Miss Kresk and Mara. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, Miss Kresk, I had been to my first visit to Marabad and Marisad, I stayed almost four months, I believe, because I was asked to take part in a play and I'd really only expected to be their day anyway, long and short. When I came back, of course, I saw Miss Kresk. And um, 
oh no, I was talking to her on the phone. She said, and what are you planning to do now? And I said, well, I, I think I'll, you know, uh, go, go back to studying dance because Mara had asked me to dance numbers of times. She said, oh my dear, you're way too old. You could do modern maybe, but become a nurse. So I, I went to um, uh, chemistry class and never had I earned a C before. I was getting like 50s on the test. And um, <laughs> so, so somehow I continued dancing. I couldn't resist. And um, eventually Miss Mara said to me, Janet had made this costume for me and I'd been in a Caribbean dance company. And, oh, you know, big hat and big skirts and flying around and legs flying this way and that way. But it was well done, that much I knew. And always um, Mara had asked me to dance and always had given me such love after. And this time she came up to shoot me and she said, now you must learn another form of dance. So it was tucked away and somehow I had left dance to become a teacher and somehow, again, drawn irresistibly to dance, I found this teacher who I never had seen flamenco, but he was so stunning. I learned flamenco. And I always looked back and thought, oh, that's because Miss Press said, look, I mean, Mara said, learn another form of dance. So it had to be. There's that story, but it's not really about Miss Press. Sorry. Well, if there are any other questions or thoughts, no, I, I, I love that. I love that, Leola, because to me, it was like Mara was, she was Baba. You know, I mean, she was the female side of God. So it's very interesting to learn another form that I, uh, I didn't, I know. I loved being around Mara because I didn't want anyone else to tell me anything. Really, <laughs> really. So it's, it's interesting. We have to go our own way. I mean, I, you know, as far as that's concerned, like Phyllis Frederick told Jack Small when Baba dropped his body, he, won, he had the money, he was just going to go for the burial. Yeah. And Phyllis says, oh, no, they need to be alone, the Mondelez. He always regretted it. So things like that, it's like you have to do what is inside you. You know, it calls to you. Yeah, and that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Yeah, thanks for asking, Rosalie. I don't know if anything else, Kathy or Viola, if you have anything else that you might want to bring. I, I, oh. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead, you go, Kathy. Okay. Uh, you know, I think Margaret was so sensitive, and she saw that when I was at Dilruba, when I first was working there, that I had sort of given up everything else, and I was helping there, and you know, envisioning this life of gopi-like dedication to these wonderful women and yet there was something missing and she was so intuitive and one day she came and sat in the book room when I was alone in there and she said, what was I planning to do? What did I want to do with my life? And I very proudly announced I was going to, you know, serve Kitty and Elizabeth and if up the world and she looked kind of <laughs> up I don't know startled or she looked she said oh this is a this place is a nunnery it's filled with old women you're young you're vital go out and contribute to the world what do you do what did you do before you came here so I said um, well I was a music teacher and she says oh that's it. Go out, teach in 
You don't want to be in a nunnery. Go out and be in the world. And, and, and what kind of music did you teach? And would you like to perform as well? And she led me through a, a whole, you know, she was, I guess, a job counselor at that moment or something, life counselor. And, and it, I found that as I reached out and found a few teaching, you know, private students and then taught at a Montessori school downtown, taught music, that I really had missed it and it was something I loved doing. And, you know, she knew and she helped me. Luckily, I was able to, you know, teach part-time and work at Del Rua part-time, but oh, Margaret was the one who felt that something was missing. And, you know, of course, that was her, teaching was her gift. And once when I talked to her about a difficult student, she said, you know, teaching is all about love. And just that simple statement helped me immensely try to work through this problem with this student. So, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. And let me see, Viola, did you want to, you, you had started to say something. I, um, thank you, Kathy, too. Thank you, Ruthie. Um, it was so beautiful. I hardly want to share, but I did have in my mind the memory of her sharing about um, coming back from India pretty much in rags and um, no, no real change of clothes, nothing. And um, can you imagine while she was there, she would be full of boils and she had the job of sitting outside by the well and she would get heat stroke and the women would tell her, put onions in your mouth. She told me to put garlic here to keep me from getting colds. You know, stick garlic right in your mouth. It's very burns, but these are things she learned. She shared with me anyway. So she had this horrible time and she was just physically a wreck and anemia, this and that. And, and um, Bob asked her to go back, she shared. And um, he asked, could she, would she be able to support herself this? And um, so in, in um, London, when she was to go to America, um, he had her get a ticket for Duncan first to go. Um, so she wasn't even to attend to herself in that way. And um, then she told this story to me about how she was very downhearted. You know, I believe it was Kitty or Rana who had marched up to her and said, oh, she shared, um, we don't think you love Baba. You're leaving him and going to the West. Of course, this was on Baba's order, but you know how it is among people. And um, as she liked to point out, the Mondali were people, although quite different people. And um, anyway, so she she said how miserable she was, and you know she just kept 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 on kicking on. And um, she said she went to a party, and I don't know whether it was with American. We know when she came over, and she was asked to um, uh, work with tutor. And, um, but you know, the dancers, there would be parties uh, after performances in different places. And she went to this party and she said, all of a sudden, it was all okay. Like she was happy and she felt Baba's presence. And um, yeah, I don't know why I wanted to share that, but it was no, it was no picnic being with Baba in many ways, but the love, as she said, um, whatever rough treatment I, he gave me afterwards, I always knew he was the embodiment, embodiment of love. And um, but I loved that she, um, and he, Baba said of her that it is her love that's drawn me to the West. He did say that. It was your love that drew me to the West, to Miss Kratz. So thank you for the reminder about love. I hope to learn how to do, I hope to be changed to do that too. Love you. <laughs>
Yeah, well, me too, Viola, me too. Thank you so much. Such beautiful deep sharings. Rosalie? Yeah, I wanted to add that Phyllis Frederick loved Margaret. Margaret was one of her all-time favorites. They, they used to send the murder mysteries back and forth. They'd read them and then they'd send them. But, you know, Phyllis and Adele lived with Elizabeth, Norena, and Nadine. And Margaret helped her stick up for herself because that was quite a... a <laughs> the big gun household, you know. I never met, uh, yeah, you know, you can imagine. Adele had a very different cut on it, but it was really hard for Phyllis. And Margaret was like so helpful, you know, to, for her to stand up for herself. Yeah, yeah. That's all I wanted to say. This is precious. Yeah. I did send Margaret a cartoon one time of a, a, a Russian person defecting and he's he's flying through the air with split legs, you know, that, that very fancy, I forget what they call it. I'm not schooled in ballet, but <laughs> she's so cute. She sent me a postcard back. Thanks for the cartoon. I like the cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> she loved humor and she was very humorous. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Rosalie. Go ahead. I'm sure she shared. Uh, well, Bob, and she had that thing where he'd point and very intensely look somewhere and she'd look to where he was looking, then he'd slap her face. <laughs> and that went on a long time. And it's actually, it's on film. I know it's on film. I've seen it in uh, Mayor Baba's Grace. They cut a little of it out, but she turns and then he quickly goes like this. And that was the last time he did it was when she, he visited the West, I think in 56. That was the last time where he jostles her shoulders also. But you know, she was just, she was just so in love with Baba. You know, she was so utterly in love, you know, that, um, yeah, I don't know, that's just another sample of it. You know, she just <laughs> was very alert to him and what he's doing and whatever, you know. Anyway, I had to say that because it is precious, but you will see it in that film, Mayor Baba's Grace, it's it's there. But it's real quick, they must have cut some of it, yeah. He'd hit her on the cheek and then they, he, you know, it was clear he was doing that, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I had to get the mischief in of it. Appreciating the mischief, yeah, yeah. And there's one picture that you showed and it's like, it is like a sitting with your fiance. The two of them are sitting yes. side by side and she's got a pretty frilly dress on. And I, I think of that ring he gave her, you know, the the because uh, she wanted to be married. I want to be engaged to you forever. Well, the way um, she told the story to me was that the uh, it was in the early days and the women were a little bit silly and they would say things like, Oh, Baba, when you were Rama, I was Sita, wasn't I, wasn't I? And they'd go on and she just thought they were so silly. So finally, I guess either that day or the next, she said to Baba, Baba, I want to be engaged to you, but you'll never have to marry me. And then the next day he showed up with that ring. So that was the way she told me the story. I, 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 I want, I want to be your fiance, but you'll never have to marry me in Baba just. <laughs> I love it. Thank I know. you. Thank Mother. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll just have a moment of silence and gratitude for such a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend and this beautiful time of remembering Baba's dancer, Miss Krask, Che Baba.
if everybody would like to unmute, we could say Avatar Mayor Papa Kiche together. Mm-hmm. Avatar, Avatar Mayor Baba Kiche. Avatar Mayor Baba Kiche. Avatar Mayor Baba Kiche. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for Thank sharing. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ruthie. Oh. And Thank Karen. You, and wonderful stories. Wow. Wonderful story. Hey, <laughs> Mayor Baba. Hey, Hi, Judy. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Bob. What a beautiful video, Ruthie. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. Wow, that was that, Thank you. Well, you know that song Buzz wrote from the the um, the poem that Monty wrote to um, Margaret. Yeah, dancer dancing. Beautiful. Yeah. So when he read that, then he just decided he was going to put it to music, and um, so I just seemed like, of course, it was perfect. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And to see her moving, you know, in those early days, and and like you said, that be- that one beautiful picture of them looking at each other, sitting next to each mm-hmm. other, and just smiling back and forth. There's such a beautiful connection, an intimate connection there. There were a lot of ones in there that I hadn't seen that have that feeling. You know, it's like I I was thinking of uh, Ambika was so loved margaret so much she loved to see that oh my gosh yeah 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 i, I, kinda... love to, I would love to share it's just that they get the uh, videos are kind of big so you have to have um you have to have some place like google or drive uh, or something that i'm more than willing to share yeah yeah, yeah. she can the link will be on youtube in a so soon she can see it that way you know i felt that um you're, you're talking about that loving expression on her face um as she's looking at bob and i felt that i saw that in in life one time um it was very near the end of her life and i had gone to see her i didn't have any personal relationship but i just felt i should go see her and the three of the dancers were there i don't remember which dancer was missing or anyway um, and she was sitting there, and it was in a porch, and I don't know what, would that have been Happy House? Cause I Happy know. House, I think, yeah. Okay, and so she was sitting there, and, and the dancers were all, they were sitting in a circle in their chairs, and um, she, her caregiver had, had um, put a ribbon in her hair, and she was wearing <laughs> lipstick, and she had some bright <laughs> color on her nails, which didn't seem particularly... I, I would not have I would not have guessed to see her that way, but that's how she was, <laughs> how she was decked out. <clears throat> and I don't even remember what they were talking about. Um, but of course, there were smiles all around, and on her face, there was a look of of happiness, of love, and of mm. of pride. I felt in her dancers, yeah. Yeah. and it was so beautiful. Her eyes were just shining. It was very uh. beautiful to see. I did see her in one public talk at the public meeting at the library. Yeah. And I don't know why, but her skin looked like the most beautiful rose petals that I could imagine, this pink rose. That's why her skin looked to me. I don't know. For some reason, I thought, I, I just, it was something about the lovingness or something because she kind of had a crusty, a crustiness about her that, that was hard for me. The boy in that at that talk, she was talking about Bob, and it, I, I could have sworn her her face was just like rose, the most beautiful rose petals, just beautiful, just beautiful. Yeah. I was there too, Rosalie, somewhere in the crowd. I was actually kind of up front, but it was packed. I remember that. It was packed, yeah. Yeah, it was in the library section of the library. They opened it up, yeah. Yeah. And when it was time, she had them lock the door. Do you remember that? 
She always did that. Yeah, I, I had gotten in. I was in there. I don't remember. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh, my. Wow. And I have something. I wrote it down. There's there was something I think when uh, the center put out a link of a video, uh, um, an audio rather file of Margaret. And there was a comment that she made about when she looked into Baba's eyes um, yeah. that she had never seen anything like it. And well, she in the, in the book, it talks about her looking into his eyes. So it's very precious, the book. She says, I can't even say. Well, this, she did say something quickly, kind of quickly yeah. quick to these young people there. And, ah, and yeah. with, you know, seeing something she had never seen and she has never seen anything like it since. And then something else at the end, and she said, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> she, had a, she had a mischief about her, certainly. Yeah. Wow. Great yeah. mischief. Great mischief. Ah, wow. Yeah. What a woman. How fortunate wow. we are. It's seven yeah. years over there. And even gets bit by a rabid dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, she gets she gets the Oscar in my book for seven <laughs> years and getting bit, and then Baba would have the symptoms read. Oh yeah, yeah. But but she really she really took care of her health when she returned because and she helped the da dancers keep on a good diet. I know she was very uh, savvy in how to eat. To sustain that life, being a you gotta have that energy. I know <laughs> there's that one picture of them all sitting on a bench. Uh, yes. One of the magazines came and took photos of Margaret's class. That's why there's that one where she has her hands up and they're all yeah, the yeah, yeah. And then there's the one where they're all kind of sitting on the bench, and you can see the one farthest away is just totally ragged out. They're like <laughs> leaning on the rail. Like they're dead, you know, like they're <laughs> dead. So, they, yeah. They, I, I uh, yeah, I, I never had a class with her, but I had a class with Brenner Mail, who she oh. took, she took late because she says, oh, like she told, uh, I guess, Viola, you were too, too old to start dancing, but she didn't like ballet. Anyway, she took him though. And he studied with her 14 years. And I tell you, uh, I got so much from our times. Phyllis, Phyllis Frederick had us. He was trying to be a Sufi or something, and it wasn't working. So he was in the Bay Area, and that, I would go to his dance class when I was there. And then but he just gave it up. The, when Mackay came along, then he... He didn't want any. He didn't want to be any part of it. 